what would we do without the wind? That's the question to keep in the back of your mind for today, Sunday, March 29th, 2020. Hello, my name is Bill Vincent. I serve as pastor of the Pacific Presbyterian Church of Pacific, Missouri, and the First Presbyterian Church of Union, Missouri. I'm glad you have chosen to join with me and others in this time of worship, and I hope you will find this meaningful for you, your faith, and your life. As we share in worship, we will engage in prayer, hear two passages of Scripture, and I will offer some of my thoughts and reflections, both on the Scriptures and our lives. If you are interested in engaging in further worship beyond this video, I call your attention to the website or Facebook page where you access this video. There you will find a file with additional worship material, including prayers and words to a couple of hymns. If you know the tune to a hymn, feel free to sing it right where you are, or you can simply reflect on the words by themselves. Let me be clear that I have not done this video on my own. I may be the person you see, but many others helped bring this opportunity to fruition. So a big thank you to all those who helped make this video possible with their expertise, their time and effort, their support and encouragement. Thank you. So now, let us begin our time of worship. We do so using a prayer by LaVon Baylor from his book, Fresh Winds of the Spirit. Let us pray. God of broken dreams and empty tombs, you meet us when we feel empty and without strength or purpose. You are present in the midst of our hopelessness and despair. You greet us in times of fulfillment and joy. You are with us when life is going well. As we hear stories of your people who have had experiences similar to our own, grant that we may know your transforming presence as they did. Bring new life to us, that we may walk as your people, affirming your gifts and celebrating your love. Amen. Our scripture readings start us off in the Old Testament with the book of the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel has a vision from God, a vision of his people's plight as they wallow in exile in a foreign land, and a vision of God's response. An additional note is called for regarding this particular scripture reading. The Hebrew word ruach, I hope I am pronouncing it somewhat accurately, my apologies to those who know better than I how to pronounce it. This Hebrew word ruach is used ten times in this passage. The word can be translated breath. It can also be translated wind or spirit. Context makes a difference in how it is translated each time. As we seek to understand this word's use in the passage, I think it is important to recognize that even when we might translate the word as breath, there is still the sense of wind and spirit behind the meaning of the word. And when we translate the word as spirit, there's always the sense of breath and wind behind the meaning of the word. As a way to remind us of the triple meaning at play with this word, I've chosen to say breath, spirit, wind, or some rearrangement of the order of those three words. I've chosen to do it that way each time the word ruach occurs in the passage. I thought this might be less confusing than actually saying ruach each time. So, with that long-winded explanation, or to be consistent, perhaps I should say with that long breath spirit-winded explanation, let us proceed to our reading. From the book of the prophet Ezekiel, the first 14 verses of chapter 37, let us listen for God's word for us. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and brought me out by the spirit-wind breath of the Lord, 
and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. The Lord led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. The Lord said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, only you know. Then the Lord said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath-spirit wind to enter you, and you shall live. I will put sinews on you, place flesh on you, and, and cover you with skin, and I will put breath-spirit wind in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had appeared on them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath-spirit wind in them. Then the Lord said to me, Prophesy to the breath-spirit wind, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath-spirit wind, Thus says the Lord God, Come, O breath-spirit wind, come from the four Wind spirit breath and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as the Lord commanded me, and the breath spirit wind entered them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then the Lord said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off, finished completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit wind breath within you, and you shall live and I will plant you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Our second scripture reading comes from the New Testament, the Gospel of John. The story we read from the 11th chapter of John takes place shortly before Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, what we will celebrate as Palm Sunday, next week. Jesus receives disconcerting news from some friends, but delays his response, leading to potentially dire consequences and amazing revelations. Once again, let us listen for God's word for us. A certain man, Lazarus, was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This was the Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jewish opposition was just now trying to stone you and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him. The disciples said to him, 
Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will get well. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were comforting Mary in the house saw her get up quickly and leave, they followed her. They assumed she was going to mourn at the tomb. When Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the benefit of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who came with Mary and saw what Jesus did believed in him. Let us pray. Dear God, bless to us the hearing of this, your word for us. But most importantly, we ask that you bless to us an understanding of it, your word in harmony with your will for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This vision of a valley of dry bones is, is so appropriate for this Sunday. When I realized that this was one of the passages for today, 
it almost took my breath away, literally. Because isn't that, in some ways, exactly what we are experiencing right now, having our breath taken away? Now, when I say that, I don't want to be seen as being flippant regarding the effects of the coronavirus on people's bodies. It is, in many ways, a respiratory illness, is it not? So please, do not misunderstand me when I speak of having our breath taken away. I don't mean to make light of the symptoms and the suffering in any way, shape, or form. Still, there is this image in our passage that, that speaks. Speaks to me, speaks to us, speaks to our situation. Having our breath taken away. Our very lives, and in many cases, our very livelihoods are so very different. It takes our breath away. The changes that have occurred in our way of life and, and the speed with which those changes have occurred, in a matter of weeks, if not days, in some cases it, it sucks the very life out of you. This is not life as we have come to expect it. And yes, there is the economy affecting us all. So much of our economy with its ripple effects, effects has had the breath knocked out of it. And then we read this story, this outlandish vision from Ezekiel about breath spirit wind being blown into bone dry skeletons, lifeless bodies. And wow, how timely. Now let's be clear regarding the original context for this vision. The people to whom these words were originally addressed were not experiencing a pandemic, but the pandemonium of exile. Uprooted from their homes and their homeland, displaced to a foreign, faraway land, feeling despondent, despairing. What's the use? Sound vaguely familiar? And then Ezekiel has this vision. God shows him the dry bones of his people and their lives. And God also shows Ezekiel a breath of fresh air, a breeze of life, and the hope that enlivens these bones and the people. But notice, that hope is not of the people's making or doing. In fact, in many ways, that really is the whole point of the story, of the vision, of the word, that the people's hope wells up not from within them, but from their God, our God. The God who has not forgotten them or us. The God who will not abandon them or us. The God who created them and us in the first place and can and will recreate them and us in this second or third or fourth or fifth place. Mortal, can these bones live? We ourselves may be asking that very question. Walter Brueggemann notes, this is always the question for Israel. Can a rescue be worked? Can the power for life override the reality of death? Asked in many ways, the urgent question is, is there a future for those who are in the power of death? Mortal, can these bones live? Can our bones live? Is there a future for us? And the answer Ezekiel gives is, O oh Lord God, only you know. How true. How true. But God also reveals further the deep answer to the question, Yes, these bones can live. Your bones, my bones. 
the bones of our lost hope and breathless pace, the bones that are dried up and dried out by too many demands and too much uncertainty and too little assurance. Yes, these bones can live, and yes, they will live. As the breeze of God's grace blows through our hearts, as the breath of God's peace takes hold of our minds, as the wind of God's Spirit touches us and nurtures us and lifts us up. Having affirmed that, notice that this passage does not offer a five-step program to recovery. It does not provide a neat map to return to life as normal. It does not give us an outline of how to embrace the Spirit and catch the wind and breathe in the breath. But it does assure us that the Spirit will come and the wind will blow and our breath, God's breath, will fill our lungs and our lives once again. Maybe not literally, I'm sorry to say. Maybe not physically in some cases. But in the depths of our souls, yes. For in life and in death, we belong to God. Always. So you might ask, that blowing, that, that breathing, that coming of the spirit wind breath, how might it happen for us in our lives? Where do we see it? How can we experience it? Where does it touch us? By way of addressing those questions, let us remember our story from the Gospel of John. Jesus' work and his words certainly ring similar to Ezekiel's experience with that wind-blown hope and life. Prophesy to the bones, prophesy to the wind, Ezekiel is told. Jesus speaks in the midst of his own experience of dead bones. Jesus speaks. He himself commands, and there is life, a reanimation of the lifeless Lazarus. But notice at the end of this story of Jesus and his work, Lazarus comes out. That's amazing in itself. Dead men do not come out, no matter how much we cry out for it to happen. But Lazarus did. Lazarus comes out, and then Jesus says, Untie him and let him go. Lazarus has heard. Lazarus has responded to Jesus' voice, to his power, to his authority, even authority over death. But Lazarus is still wrapped up in the burial claws of death. Do we know that existence as well? Maybe we feel like we have truly heard Jesus call to us his voice, a voice reminiscent of wind blowing over ancient bones, of a breeze rattling dried out bones. We may have heard his voice, but do we know the full freedom of spirit-infused life? What burial claws still cling to us? What vestiges of death still weigh on us, threatening to, to drag us down once again into the tomb? We mentioned one last week, fear. Oh, how it clings to us. Oh, how it manipulate, manipulates us to act irrationally. Oh, how its power is over us to, to twist our thoughts, to mangle our minds. How about resentment? Do we resent the changes we have had to make in our lives so that we want to strike out and take out our anger and frustration on others? Are we so suspicious that we cannot or will not believe anyone or anyone's word and so do not trust the guidance being given as how best to combat this virus? Or are we so overwhelmed that we cannot go on? We sit on our couches or stay in bed because what's the use? 
Yet Jesus calls to us as well. Lazarus, come out. Phil, come out. Adrian, Vanessa, Sonia, come out. Byron, Juan, David, come out. The call is made. The invitation is extended. The offer is there before us. The hope is there. The grace is extended. The new beginning is here before us. Will we reach out and take hold of it? Will we trust that the God who has been with us before through dark times and bad will be with us even now, even in this unprecedented time? Will we hear God's voice addressed to us and respond? Will we open our hearts and our lives to the fresh wind of God's Spirit that we might open our hearts and our lives to each other? Prophesy to the bones! Ezekiel is told. He prophesies, proclaims to our bones as well, in words ancient and as timely as they get. The Lord God says, I will put my spirit wind breath within you, and you shall live. I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit wind breath within you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Do you believe this? Jesus asks Martha. I am the resurrection and the life, he said. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do we? This, this is a hope not only for the future, but also for the present, here and now. This is a hope that we can live into and a hope we can live out of. So let us live it. Let us act on it. Let us be it. Let us be this hope. To affirm our faith in the God who says it is so to bolster the faith of those who aren't sure themselves, to embody the life and love of the God who calls us from death to life even now. See, the wind is blowing. A breeze is breathing new life, and God's Spirit is moving in our midst. Catch the wind. Take in the breath. Embrace the Spirit and share the life that God gives you. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, speak to us. Come to us. Embrace us with your life, that we might know it and live it and share it for you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This concludes our worship sharing for today. Remember, additional worship material can be found on the website or Facebook page where you access this video, and feel free to explore those pages to find out more about the Pacific Presbyterian Church and the First Presbyterian Church of Union. Thank you for joining us today. Next week, we will ponder the question, do palm leaves have thorns? Until next time, may God's grace be upon you, God's peace be within you, and God's arms be around you. Blessings to you all.